Welcome to the dark stream. Vox Day, voxday.blogspot.com, and Infogalactic News. Not a whole lot going on at the moment. Um, I think it's interesting to see that um, you know that there's not as much hysteria in the media about the North Korean situation, despite the fact that nothing has improved. You know, um, I mean, the only thing that's happened is that uh, Kim Jong Un has demonstrated the capability to launch nuclear missiles farther than they had believed before. So, um, so I'm kind of it's, it's interesting to to think about how um, you know people are getting wrapped up in everything from the from the uh, hacking attack with the NSA tools to more nonsense related to um, uh, to Trump and the Russians and, and all that sort of thing, Comey and whatnot. Um, you know, meanwhile, the North Koreans just demonstrated that they can probably nuke Hawaii, um, certainly can hit Beijing, Tokyo, um, part of Russia, and possibly even the West Coast. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm a little astonished that, um, that, that people are still uh, paying attention to, to, you know, all these petty things when there's a, a real prospect for uh, a significant um, and, and prospectively terrible war. So, anyhow, um, but yeah, the, the, I mean, on, on the other hand, um, it's also probably true that, you know, there's not really much to talk about, you know, there's only so much, um, discussion of what could happen, uh, that's, that's possible, you know, um, I mean, yes, there are still ships in the, in the, the Pacific. Um, so anyhow, um, we'll just have to wait and see and, and hopefully, uh, Hopefully things won't get too bad. Um, but yeah, uh, I've seen a couple of you commenting on the shirt. I am still not tired of winning. Uh, I think that I think that uh, people are getting too impatient. Um, I should probably mention Ann Coulter's recent column where she was talking about how she was afraid that the Trump haters are right and so forth. Um, I don't think that's correct. I don't... Um, as I have been saying from the beginning, the, uh, the task is considerably greater than most people understand. Um, <laughs> Anne is up to something. I think that's entirely possible. Um, that's true. Uh, Mike Cernovich says that something big is coming soon. Um, you know, and, and it does look quite... Uh, I do think that there probably is a shakeup in mind. Um, and, you know, we'll just have to wait and see what happens. I don't believe that it's going to include Bannon. That strikes me as wishful thinking by the media. I do think that, uh, there's a very good chance that, uh, and I hope that Trump is going to get rid of a number of the moderates. Um, you know, it wouldn't be a surprise. I mean, obviously people expect, uh, Spicer to go, um, you know, he hasn't proved himself to be very, very competent, and hopefully, uh, Rents Privus will will be going as well. Um, I doubt we're going to see any significant changes in the the military areas, um, although certainly <laughs> uh, there should be some sort of um, some sort of changes in the NSA. You know, I think that um, I think that. Whoever is involved in the leaking is going to be uh, removed very quickly because one thing that we know about Trump is he is a loyalist. You know, somebody who is uh, known for their loyalty tends to be un unusually intolerant of disloyalty. You know, one thing that, one thing that people have uh, commented on many times 
is the loyalty between me and the Dread Elk. You know, um, a lot of, of people, some of them with much bigger followings than I have, have expressed um, a degree of envy uh, for the way that, that my supporters and my followers always show up and are always reliable. And, and I very much appreciate that. But part of that is because I'm loyal to them. You know, um, it, it has to go, loyalty is always a two-way street. And so um, Trump is, is known for his loyalty. He demonstrated his loyalty to people, especially during the campaign, when he could have thrown people under the bus and he very pointedly refused to do so. But what that means and what some of those people in the administration should have understood is that um, anyone who gives that kind of loyalty expects that kind of loyalty. So, um, yeah, I think I think that Flynn was treated pretty well. Um, a lot of people complained about that, but I, I didn't I didn't see any reason, and I have absolutely no doubt that Flynn was involved in whatever decision. Um, and yeah, well, I like what that commenter just said about how uh, how Trump tried working things out the normal way. That is actually a very good sign. A lot of people don't realize it. The sign of a serious man is someone who tries to work things out reasonably before he goes and steamrolls everybody. Okay? The kind of men... The, 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 <laughs> we'll get to that. Um, we'll get to that leftist. Um, the... Uh, you know, a reasonable man, an experienced man, a strong man, has uh, always tries as a first option to reach a reasonable conclusion. You know, Trump went in there, he was elected, you know, he was clearly the president, um, he was, you know, clearly had the right to do whatever he wanted, and yet he still chose to try to work with people. And he has found that they're not actually willing to work with him. And so I did nothing to my sound. Um, that's Periscope, not, not my system. Um, so anyhow, uh, Trump has made a strong and, and significant effort to work with the establishment. And they have, for the most part, simply spit in his face. And so what I expect that he is going to do, we'll find out, but what I expect that he's going to do is I expect that he's going to become consistently more hardline, not all at once, but in a measured and consistent manner, giving them the opportunity to play along. Because that's what he prefers to do. The kind of people, you know, anytime you're, you're talking to people that are just significant, serious hardliners, they tend to be gammas. They tend to be low-status guys who have no experience of, of leadership, no experience of being in a position, a responsible position, where other people are depending upon you. And so they, they, they plan the whole thing, they play everything out in their heads. And, and they, they, I would do this, and I would, I would do this, and I would demand this. And the thing is, of course, that's why they turn out to be such petty dictators whenever they get any power. And that's also why they tend to be complete disasters. Because they think that leadership means I'm the leader, I get to tell everyone what to do. And that just that just doesn't work. And so um, Trump is serious about let, let's go ahead and address the, the the lefty here. Trump is serious about improving economic conditions for working people. You know, the problem is that um, most of the ideas that people have for improving the working conditions or improving the economic conditions for working people are bad ideas and are doomed to failure. You know, a lot of, I mean, I, we won't get into the details, but I've written an entire book about, uh, there's a whole chapter in my book, Return of the Great Depression. It's called No One Knows Anything. And I demonstrate very clearly and from with, with historical economic facts released by the relevant um, released by the relevant 
uh, economic authorities, and I show that the margin of error is considerably greater than the difference between growth and contraction. So it is absolutely impossible to make any sort of reasonable decision, policy decision, based on the numbers that are being reported. So how do you, when you don't even know, when your margin of error is so great that you don't even know if what you're doing is causing the economy to grow or contract, how can you possibly come up with a reasonable policy? You know, how can you tweak policy in order to benefit people, you know, stuff that's several um, layers deep in the process? It's not possible. Now, Trump is doing, and here's what a lot of people on both the right and the left don't want to admit. If we, if we want to have economic growth, then we have to do two things. Number one, we have to get rid of whatever you want to call this relatively free trade. And you also have to get rid of uh, immigration and you have to deport large numbers of immigrants. Immigrants of the quality that we've had over the last 50 years absolutely destroy the economy. They are net negative and it's not even close. You know, and that's not even counting the fact that um, you know, all the additional expenses that, that uh, you know, it was kind of funny. Um, in Sweden, uh, they're running into huge budget problems because they've just discovered that um, all these migrants that they supposedly needed, you know, because our birth rates are low, we need more people, we'll, we'll allow all these, all these Syrians and, and other Arabs to come in. Well, guess what? You know, less than one percent of them are employed, and so. Um, <laughs> but that's the point. They're not even getting cheap labor, and the brown underclass that they've gotten are not at all compliant. And so it's it's a it's a complete disaster. Um, you know, you you, know, you look at you look at California, you look at Sweden. Um, you know, and you can see that the basic assumptions that we've had about uh, economics and immigration are completely wrong, are completely false. And so, um, no, I don't, I don't think, you know, Trump is a civic nationalist. He's not alt-right. And so I don't think that he has the conceptual model that will permit him to do what really needs to be done. You know, I think he's got, he's also, on the financial side, he's got too much, um, <laughs> the problem is, well, of course you can, but you need to keep in mind that, I mean, see, you're a leftist, so you naturally want to uh, find an expert with credentials to tell you what to do. That's how the left thinks. But, it's irrelevant. What matters is is who is right and who is observably not. It doesn't matter if there's 100% uh, consensus among economists saying that immigration is good for the economy. We know that it isn't. You know that it isn't. All you have to do is look at it. How do you know? Look at who predicts what's going to happen. I predicted the 2008 financial crisis. I was one of about 14 economic writers who did. I predicted it back in 2002, very clearly. You know, it doesn't take a great brain to understand that that we have a huge debt issue right now. You know, and and part of the problem, just to be, uh, just to be fair, for, um, to the economists. Uh, you know, when you read Steve Keen's book, uh, either of them, the new one or the, or the old one, and the old one's a bit technical, then what you can see is that, uh, no, see, again, you're, you're completely wrong. The, again, you're, you're look. see, so you're saying, oh, they've had a negligible impact, blah, 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 but they're basing that decision on bad statistics. Remember, what I would do. Remember what I 
Yes, I know that's the stats. I'm telling you that the stats are utter fiction. And you can verify this for yourself. All you need to do is look at each of the GDP reports. In the US, they come out with, it used to be four, I think it's three now, for each quarter. All you gotta do is keep track of the those three reports for each quarter, and what you will see is that the margin of error is greater than the difference between growth and contraction. Not only that, but if you look at, if you keep track of the history of them, and, and I, I do, what you'll find out is, in fact, um, how many of you, okay, uh, go ahead and hit, hit we're going to do a little test here. Everybody stop, don't hit any hearts, don't hit any hearts. That's still hitting hearts. I want you to stop hitting hearts for a second, okay? I'm gonna ask two questions, and I want, I want you to, to hit the hearts when the answer to the question is yes. So the, so the first question is, how many of you believe that there was a economic recession in 2001 in the United States. How many of you remember that? How many of you believe that that was the case? Go ahead and hit the hearts if, if you agree. Okay, so we have a pretty strong consensus here that there, if you don't recall, just don't say anything. This was 2001. Now, so we have a pretty strong consensus. Okay, stop, no more hearts. Stop with the hearts. Okay. <laughs> So I swear, there's like, I think like one or two last one. Um, now, how many of you, not, not don't remember, how many of you are sure that there was no recession in 2001? Okay, so you guys, you guys saw the difference there, right? A lot of people remember the 2001 recession. You know, everybody, everybody recalls it, I recall it that sort of thing. Well, guess what? If you go and you look up the GDP statistics now, because they've been revised several times, there was no economic recession. There were no two quarters of economic contraction, two, two consecutive quarters of economic contraction in 2001. Okay? Now the answer is there was in statistical terms, there was a economic contraction, there was a recession in 2001, but because the numbers have been so massaged and modified since then, that recession no longer exists. Even though you can go on Google and type in 2001 recession. Go ahead, somebody do that. See if, type into Google, and then see if it says anything about a recession in 2001. See what I mean? So that, um, my leftist friend, is what you're dealing with. Considering that they statistically made a recession vanish in only 15 years, how can you possibly put any credence in using those very statistics? <laughs> yes, you can go back to doing whatever you want. Um, how can you justify any policy behavior, any policy interpretation at all on the basis of these contradictory and therefore obviously false statistics. You can't. It gets worse though. It gets worse. We're just, right now we're just talking about the, the observable statistics. We're just, we're talking about the practical side, right? Well, um, let me let me go ahead and blow your mind a little bit. Um, you just tap on the screen, I think, to do the hearts. Um, let me blow your mind a little bit. And that is, um, I, I'll tell you why the wages have been stagnating and negative since 1973 in a minute. Um, the big, the big, uh, the thing that should blow your mind is the entire basis for the economic, conventional economic models is false. All of those models, 
And this is not a right-wing versus left-wing thing. All of those models, going back to the original law of supply and demand, Adam Smith's law of supply and demand, all of them are based on a false assumption that demand is stackable. You know, the whole idea is that you can take my demand curve and add it to your demand curve. And, and um, so you add these things together and then that gives us a macro curve for the entire economy. But that doesn't work because the fundamental math is wrong. That's what Steve Kinkoff talks about. And that's why when I wrote a column about him in his book, I said he, he you know, I don't agree with him on everything. He's, he's more of a, a bit more of the left. We tend to agree on debt in general. Um, you know, he thinks that government can do something effective about it. I don't. But, but where, where um, I really admire his work is the fact that he went out, you know, he, he detected, I mean, I detected kind of the same BS, but I never really, I, I never really thought to look into that one. But he demonstrates very clearly that demand is not stackable, and therefore the law of supply and demand does not apply at all. Now, we already knew to a certain extent that it was bullshit. We already knew that because of what they called uh, luxury consumption goods. Okay? Think about it. <laughs> See? That's what I mean. It's mind-blowing. It completely, completely changes our fundamental understanding of, e of economics. And so, um, so anyhow, uh, now, now we already had the hints. I mean, the reason I was always a little bit dubious about the su supply and demand curve is that it just doesn't apply to, to certain types of goods. Think about it. Would you rather have Apple stock when it's cheap? Is the, is the demand for Apple stock higher or lower when it's cheap than when it's expensive? It's much higher when it's expensive. That's completely contradictory to the law of supply and demand. Now they tried to come up, there's a term, I, I can't recall the term right at the moment, it's a type of good. Um, it was like, uh, it was like uh, Veblen and conspicuous consumption got into it a little bit. They, they came up with a, a, a special name for these type of goods to which it didn't apply. Um, but it's also true, of, it's not just true of investment stuff, it's in true of you know, a Ferrari. You know, the more expensive a Ferrari gets, the more people want it. And so, um, no, it has nothing to do with planned obsolescence. It's a, um, there's, it's a type of good. Um, yeah, Bitcoin's another example. So anyway, to, to get back to immigration, this is where, and this is where 1973 comes in. Who, uh, well, I, I can't, I won't we'll play the guessing game, I'll just tell you. The reason that wages peaked in 1973 is that starting in 1951, um, starting in 1950, the women began entering the workforce. Basically, um, young women began entering the workforce. And between 1950 and 1973, the number of women in the workforce doubled. It went from one-third of women to two-thirds of all women working in the workforce, most of them young. You know, they used to get married and, and so forth um, and have kids. Instead, they went, into, they went to college and went to, got into the workforce. So it was basically the middle and upper middle class. You know, the lower, the working class women had always worked. Now, the reason that it didn't affect wages negatively at that point was because old men were leaving the workforce. Men used to work much later. And so, so what was happening is that the, the size of the workforce was not changing very much. It was growing, but it was growing at about the same rate as the economy. So what happened was the, the young women came into the workforce, the old, old men left. However, in 1973, um, that was when that transition process completed. And so um, you had immigrants coming in you know, because the, the laws changed in 1965, you started seeing the immigrant boom, and the uh, old men uh, stopped, stopped leaving the workforce. And so, essentially what we traded was a workforce that consists, that was heavily male, 
Uh, and so what we have now is that instead of having families, young women work in order to support old men out playing golf. And so that is why the wage rates fell. Also, it didn't help that um, it, it didn't help at all that um, that women did not, you know, immigrants at least when they come in, they might lower wages, but they also uh, they do increase consumption a bit. Women are already consuming, and so when they enter the workforce, there's no increase in consumption to balance the increase in supply. So, um, so that means that the, their effect has to be negative. It's going to suppress wages. And so if you're going to, if you want to help the working class, one of the best things that you can do is to reduce the number of women in the workforce and get them back getting married, having families, and so forth. Also, that will lead to a higher quality workforce because you know, one of the, the little understood effects of this mass post-1965 immigration is that it has lowered the average IQ of the American people by somewhere between four to eight IQ points. And so, um, you know, this is absolutely disastrous, but most people don't even realize that it's happened. So, anyhow, um, <laughs> we completely failed to get to um, to get to the point. That's okay. Um, you know, we don't have to. This this is not any sort of formal structured thing. So, um, I appreciate. I appreciate the questions, and um, I, uh, I'm always happy to, to answer questions, and it's nice to get to kick around uh, some, some economic concepts um, here and there. So anyhow, um, have a good evening. Thanks for stopping by, and um, you know, I, I'll just add on off one final note. I'm very excited to see what's coming up soon with uh, these these big things that uh, that Cernovich is talking about. So, have a good evening and buona serata.